very simply certain Bible passages which mention the sun, moon and, and, and the stars. And uh, what I want to do is to, to, to evidence the veracity of the scriptures and really to, to demonstrate the wonders of the creation. So, first of all, just to, to um, define our terms, by astronomy, we, we mean uh, observational astronomy. In other words, what you can observe with the naked eye or through a, a medium-sized telescope from the Earth. Um, we're not talking about the science of theoretic astronomy, and we're, we're not uh, talking about astrology, which is completely different and is the, 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 the deceit of of soothsayers uh, and which the Bible uh, condemns. That's not anything related to our subject this, e uh, this evening. So what I want to do is start off at the uh, beginning of um, uh, the subject in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 uh, and verse 14, where we have the, the record of the creation of the heaven and the earth. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, uh, 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of, of, of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Now, that's the, the basis of biblical astronomy, the uh, creation of the lights that were set in the heaven. Um, it's not the subject I want to even really venture on uh, this evening. But notice that it doesn't say that God created the sun and the moon. It says that he created lights. And there is a nuance there, because in actual fact, the moon is not an intrinsic light. It's a reflector of light. But I don't really want to go and delve any, any further into that area um, tonight. But there is an, a, a nuance there that you might find interesting. But the point I want to make is in verse 14 that they were, they were put there uh, for signs, seasons and days uh, and years. And to this day, um, humankind has measured time by the relative movement of the sun and of the moon uh, and uh, of, 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 of the stars. So what I want to do is just delve into that subject in a little bit more detail. At a very basic level, the sun is, is used to this day to determine what is a day and what is a night. So the sun rises in the morning, it sets in the evening, and as it says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5, the, the, the evening and the morning are the first day. They are the definition of, of a day. But you can also uh, use the sun to measure uh, a, a year, a solar year. And that is what it was intended for, as you see in Genesis 1 and verse 14. They were for signs, for days, which we've just looked at, and for years. Now, you might, uh, if you go to Psalm 104, um, there's a verse there which you might find interesting. Psalm 104 and verse 19, where it says, He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth his going down. And it is certainly true, uh, just as a, very, as, a, as a very casual observer of the sun, that the sun sets at different points on, on the horizon every day. Now, um, on the screen in front of you, there's just a very simple I illustration of this. And what the photographer has done, he's, he's taken a picture in the northern hemisphere of sunset. And he's, he's taken four pictures and superimposed the four pictures on each other. And you can see that when he took a picture on the 15th of March, um, Hopefully you can see my laser beam uh, there. The, the sun was setting right down in, 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 the, in the south. But when he took the picture on the 7th of June, um, it was setting uh, in a different position on the horizon. Now, if you start to um, 
look at that in, in, in a more methodical way. I want you to imagine you're standing on the same spot and you're, you're watching the sunset or the sun rising over a complete year. You've probably got better things to do than to stand on the same spot for a year, but just imagine that you did that. And you would notice that there is an, a northern extremity of its motion across the horizon and there is a southern extremity uh, of its point as it, as, it, as it actually rises. And those days in which those extremities are reached are midwinter and midsummer. They're the, the winter and the summer solstice. Now, if you mark those positions with a post or a stone, you can then gauge when it is the height of summer and when it's the, 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 the height of winter. And if you, if you make those stones or those markers permanent, you've then got the, the, the beginning and the end of a year, and you've measured a solar year just by observing the sun on the horizon. And approximately the halfway point between those two extremities, uh, that's the halfway point through the year. And it, it marks the spring and the autumn equinox. So that's very useful if you're a farmer in ancient times. And um, you, you can then, you, you can, from observing the sun and, and seeing where it is in relation to your markers that you've made, you can tell whether it's uh, the depths of winter and spring is about to start or whether when it's the, the height of summer and autumn is about to start. And you can use that for planting. And that actually probably is what uh, ancient stone monuments, such as Stonehenge in the UK, were actually used, uh, actually used for. Um, I think um, if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 5, when it says that God called the light day and the darkness he called night, the evening and the morning were the first day. I, my personal belief is that um, creation actually took place at what we would call the autumn equinox, because that, that day around uh, the, 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 towards the end of September is the, is the day when there is an equal period of 12 hours of daylight and an equal period of 12 hours of darkness. And it seems to me that if, if, if day was equally divided from night, that it would be actually take place on or around the equinox as to the time of year uh, when the creation actually took place. So I've got a graphic there. The pictures generally that I've got, on the screen, I, I give a credit for for the Earth Sky organization on the on the internet. But it shows you graphically that if you're standing and looking at the sunrise toward the east, it shows you um, how, how the sun would move across the, the the horizon. Of course, this is reversed for 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 those of you in in the southern hemisphere. So you can use the time to, to determine what the, the sun to determine what a day is. You can use it to determine um, the seasons and the solar years, but you can also use it to, to determine uh, the, the time of the day because as the sun progresses across the sky, it casts a shadow at a particular angle. And all you need is a stick. So we've got a, a picture there of a stick in, in, in the sand and you can see it's casting a shadow. And that shadow will move during the day. So if you've got your stick in the sand, if you're out there in the outback, uh, you can put 12 pebbles in, a, in, in an arc around the, around the stick, and you can approximate the hours of a day. And that would be what we would know as a very rudimentary sundial. So... Um, if you go to Isaiah chapter 38, Isaiah chapter 38, you find that sundials were um, extant in ancient times. And King Ahaz, the king of Israel, actually had one. They were also known to the ancient Egyptians. Now, the, uh, we, we're in Isaiah chapter 38, and we're going to read verse 8. The, the, the translation, the sundial, is, is probably inaccurate. It, it was probably some archaeological uh, some architectural device that enabled you, the, the, the shadow of the sun, to appear on steps, on a, on a flight of steps. That's probably what it was. But here in verse 8 of, of Isaiah 38, you can see that the shadow of the sun 
went down in the sundial of Ahas 10 degrees or 10 markers and the sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. So you can see even in ancient times, uh, they had a means of, de of, of um, telling what hour of the day it was by the observation of the sun. Now, the picture that you've got in front of you is of, uh, is of a sundial, and it's taken from the church at Iam in the Peak District in England. And I selected this picture uh, some time ago, but it's particularly topical because Iam was the uh, village in the uh, Peak District that suffered very badly from the bubonic plague um, in, 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 the, in 1665. And it's famous because it actually went into isolation. It went into total uh, lockdown for about 14 months to, to stop the plague in that village. I thought that was perhaps quite topical for the days in, in which we live. So it's a pity the sun wasn't shining when this picture was taken. But you can see here that you can tell the, the time, um, and that's the scale out on the edge, that would be the shadow. But the, the, length of the, the length of the shadow, if you look very carefully, there's markers for the length of the shadow. And um, the length of the shadow that it casts, not the angle, but the length, you can actually tell what month of the year it is. So not only from the sun can you tell the time of the day, from the length of, of the shadow, you can also tell uh, what month it is once you, you, you've methodically uh, worked it all out. So the sun is used for years, it's used for seasons, it's used for days, you can tell the time of the day, and you can even tell the month uh, you, using a, a simple device like a sundial. Now, moving on, we want to talk about the moon. Now, the moon has phases, and I've put a, a graphic there which just shows you how the phases of the moon uh, appear uh, in the northern hemisphere. And uh, as you appreciate, it actually does it the opposite way around in, in the southern hemisphere. So what, what I've done here is taken um, a calendar, and it shows you the phases of the moon. Now, this, if you look right at the top, relates... Um, to the, to the Northern Hemisphere, you can see it set there. And I'm going to show you it's going to be different for the Southern Hemisphere. But uh, a, lunar, uh, a lunar month is 20, approximately 29 days, and it starts with a new moon uh, there, when a slither of light appears in the Northern Hemisphere on the right-hand side. Um, and that, that is um, the beginning of a month. And then at the end of the month, the moon disappears and it appears as a slither of light on the left-hand uh, side. Now, from that, you can see that you can actually measure months. And the Hebrews used to measure time with lunar months according to the phases of the moon. Now, if you look at the moon um, you, uh, and you're aware of the phases, you can tell uh, when you're halfway through a month because... How, uh, so, sorry, the, you can tell the weeks of, of the month because in the Northern Hemisphere, um, after seven days, it's half illuminated. So you, you know you're seven days into the month, approximately. Two weeks into the month, approximately, there's always a full moon. It's always the case. And then by the time you get to the third week, um, uh, it's the opposite side of the moon that's illuminated. And then, of course, it, it, it disappears very briefly before the, moon, the, the new moon appears. So you can actually tell, just by if you're a shepherd sitting in a field, you can actually tell very, very approximately what week it is. And almost, if you're very skillful, you can tell approximately what, what the date of the month is. And just while we're on this screen, I'm just going to click over to the Southern Hemisphere setting. And there you can see it's actually reversed. And, and you, you, your new moon actually starts because you're, you're actually inverted in, in Brisbane, or we are, which is depending on your point of view. It, the, the, the new moon slither of light actually appears on the opposite side. But um, that shows to you that the moon can be used to count the days of a month. 
And if you are an Israelite and you're going to, to celebrate Passover, uh, you will see that Passover always takes place on a full moon because the 14th of Abib is halfway through a lunar month. And Passover is always a full moon. And that's really an undesigned coincidence, because when Israel came out of Egypt, um, of course, they were guided, guided by a pillar of cloud uh, and, and a pillar of fire. But it was under the, the light of a full moon. And in ancient times, whenever you wanted to move armies or masses of people, you would always do so under the light of uh, a, 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 a full moon. So that's just... Uh, a, a coincidence there. So a lunar moon is about 25 and a half days long, approximately. There's 12 and a half in, in, in a year. And so that doesn't, the, the 12 lunar months doesn't quite coincide uh, with a solar time, uh, with, with a solar year. They're, they're slightly out of sync always. Um, and if you go to Isaiah chapter 66, um, very briefly, you can see an illustration there of the phrase, the new moons, um, which were used by ancient Israelites to count their months. So this is um, Isaiah chapter 66, and it's verse uh, 23. Uh, it shall come to pass that one, from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. And that shows you how they use the new moon to delineate their months. Now, the fact that there, there isn't a perfect synchronism between a solar year and 12 lunar months, um, that is actually design. It's divine design because it enables you to measure much longer periods of time than a single year. Because if you can measure years and then you can synchronize it with the phase of the moon, when that repeats itself, you've got a much longer era of time. And that's the reason why God designed uh, it in that way, uh, I, I would uh, suggest. Now, the time of the year can also be determined by the position of the constellations. Certain constellations, or, and what, what I mean by constellations, are an easily recognisable pattern of stars. They pass through the southern meridian in a line of succession. And we're going to have a look at an example of this in the next slide. Um, but uh, it, it's like the, 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 the night sky, it's like a giant clock. And if you look at the, the, the constellation of Cancer, which we're going to have a look at in a few moments' time, you will find that it always passes uh, the uh, southern meridian or the due south point of the sky um, at a certain time, at a certain time of year as well. So if, you, if you're a shepherd and you're, you're sitting in the night sky in December, you, you will be able to tell what time of night it is by the position of the constellation of Cancer because you will know in December um, uh, Cancer is always due south at midnight, and it is. Um, so to, to tell the time by night, you need to know um, where due south is. And the very easy way of telling where due south is at night when you haven't got the sun is, it, it, it is really by the moon. Because when, when the moon is a crescent moon and it's high in the sky, if you draw a line between the two uh, points of the crescent down to the horizon, Provided the moon is high in the sky, that line in the northern hemisphere will always point to due south on the horizon. It doesn't work when it's very low down in the sky, but it, that principle does work when it's high in the sky. And of course, the opposite is true in the southern hemisphere. So let me show you this uh, graphic. Um, hopefully it will work of the night sky. Now you can see the date here. Of, of the night sky, Wednesday the 29th, uh, 2020. And I'm going to run this now, and it will show you, um, it will start moving in a moment, but it will show you the night sky on that day. You can see the, the stars, it's speeded up, but you can see the stars moving across the night sky. Now, I'm going to attempt to, to stop the graphic, 
uh, at about midnight. If I can manage to do that, that would be great. Uh, I've stopped it nearly at midnight. And you can see there, um, if I can just highlight it, the, the, the constellation of Cancer is crossing the southern meridian at, at midnight. And shepherds, you know, keeping their flocks would know, be able to tell from the position of the stars at night, uh, at certain, uh, every month, um, what the time of night it was. And you, if, you, if you run the, 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 the graphic even more, then, um, you, you know, you could get to, to say, one o'clock, I'm trying to stop it at, a, at an hour, um, you would see that the star regulus is due south. So you would know it's about two o'clock uh, in the morning when that happens. And you can run it through and you can wait for an, a notable star. And I'm, I've got my eye on Arcturus just there. But when that crosses the horizon, you know, you, you'd know it's nearly five o'clock in the in the morning when that when that happens so you can tell the time if you're experienced by the position of the stars at night so let me just stop that graphic um, and move on to the next screen so what the, the the ancients did is they divided the night sky into 12 easily um pat recognizable patterns of stars and they called that the zodiac. And these patterns of stars were all ones that were fixed on, on what is, um, what the, 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 they used the line of the sun across the sky. Um, and it, that's called the ecliptic. And it's the stars that appear on that ecliptic is the ones that they used. And there's 12, they, they divided the sky into 12 notional groupings or patterns along that imaginary line of the sky where you would normally see the sun and the moon. Um, and, and that's what they, the positions of those asterisms or patterns of stars are what they used really to tell the time. And they're mentioned in the Bible. If you go to, to the book of, of, of Job, Job chapter 38, you will see uh, that in Job chapter 38 and it's verse 32, um, that Job's, uh, uh, the, 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 the God says to Job, canst thou bring forth Mazareth in his season, or canst thou guide after us with his sons? Well, Mazareth, commentators uh, generally uh, believe to be a reference to the constellations, to the, the, the constellations of the zodiac. It's plural, so it, it means more than one constellation. And, of course, the zodiac was... was um, misused by by mankind and i've got a couple of scriptures there in the second of kings 23 and isaiah 47 which we won't refer refer to now but it, of course it was misused in the 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 dark and uh, uh, and wrong art of, of of fortune telling as they supposed it was possible uh, but it, from a, a biblical point of view, the constellations were there to enable you to tell the time uh, during the night. So, as a basis, uh, as a summary of the measurement of time in Genesis 1, you can measure solar years, you can measure new months, um, you, can, you can measure uh, from the, de the, the day of the month by the phase of the moon, you can use a sundial to determine the time of day, and you can use the position of stars to determine the time of night, uh, and that is actually the basis of, of sea navigation. So that really is uh, 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 um, an explanation of, of how the uh, heavens are used as the basis of time. Now, I'd like you to turn to... Um, uh, the, the next scripture I want to illustrate, which is in the Judges, Judges chapter 5. Um, uh, and we're just going to read verse 20. It's part of a song, the song of Deborah and Barak. And it's a rather obscure saying. Um, it's talking about the, the battle that took place. And it says, they fought from, from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. 
Well, that doesn't mean that they were stars fighting against uh, this Gentile king. What it, what it means when it says the stars in their courses, it, it, it's actually describing how the stars move across the sky. Now, this is a, a northern hemisphere uh, illustration, and it's speeded up. But if you notice, if you keep a, an eye on a particular star like Albedon or, or uh, Betelgeuse, which the two orange-looking stars there, um, you will see that they, they move across the sky. Just wait for the graphic to start, uh, and you see that they're, they're following a line across the sky. And they'll follow this arc. You'll see it. And that, that arc is what the Bible means as they move across the sky. Um, that is what it means by the course of a star. It's the course that a star follows during the night as it moves across the sky, just like the sun uh, moves across the sky during the day. And what, what it's saying really in the vernacular in Judges 5 and verse 20 is that time was against uh, Sisera. Uh, the night was long, uh, and of course uh, he he was uh, defeated by the armies of Deborah and Barak, and that's all it means. But it, it's just a, a sort of a quaint saying to express time, the stars in their courses, and um, but it shows how uh, the courses of the stars are used to determine time. Now you can actually see the course of a star by using photography. And I've got there a photograph where uh, um, the photographer has pointed his camera to the night sky and he's just ex he's opened the shutter for a, quite a long exposure. I would estimate he's probably had an exposure of about um, two hours for the purpose of this photograph. And these lines that you can see is a star. And because the camera's fixed and the sky has an apparent motion, um, it appears as a line. Uh, and that really, it, you can see there the, the course of a star, just a segment of the course of a star uh, as it goes across the night, the night sky. It's just a different way of illustrating the, the same principle. Now, I want you to move on to the first official report of the Corinthians in chapter 15, where we have another reference to the sun, moon and stars in the scripture. And here, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the resurrection of the dead. And uh, it, it, it's verse 41 that I want you to re refer to. He's talking about how um, the, the, the saints will be raised from the dead and... and, and um, to different positions. Verse 41 of 1 Corinthians uh, 15, there is one glory of the sun, in other words, that's really bright. There's another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. And then he says, for one star differeth from another star in glory. And I want to illustrate by looking at some of the stars that that is true, that one star does differ from another star in its glory. Um, well, I've chosen a star to, 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 to illustrate this, uh, and it's called Al Albiro, um, and it, it, it's a, a star that crosses the southern, hemi the, the southern skies uh, in, in Coventry, but it's also visible in, the, in your northern sky in Brisbane, and you can actually see it at the moment just before sunrise if you stay up all night, but you'll get a better view of it during the month of June. Now, Albiro is in the constellation of Cygnus. It's an Arabic name. A lot of the stars bear Arabic names. And it means the hen's beak. Now, when you look at it, this, this star, it looks like a single star. But when you put it under a, a, a telescope, it, it actually appears as two stars. And it's what astronomers call a double star. And they're, they're very, very common. A lot of stars are double stars. But what makes this remarkable is that when you look at the two stars side by side they're different colors and double stars when you get two stars very close together it, it's useful because it enables you to compare the color of a star 
in the same field of view. And what I'm demonstrating to you is that stars differ in glory in the sense they actually have different colours. Now, we're going to have a look at uh, Albero under um, a, a, a telescope. And um, the, the, this uh, ring here is the... the, the this is a, a, an artificial view, computer-generated, that you would see in my telescope. And right in the middle, this single star, you can see, starts to split into two. You can see two points of light there right in the center of the circle. Now, when you, when you, when you mag that's just magnified at times 50. But when you magnify it with a, a large telescope, and this is a, a picture from um, uh, the telescope at the Jodrell Bank uh, Observatory in the UK, you can see the two stars. And you can see straight away they're different sizes, but most of all, you can see they're different colours. And that's what the Apostle Paul means when he says that one star differs from another star in its glory. Stars have colours, and you can really appreciate them um, when, you, when you put them under a telescope. Now, what I do when I'm observing the stars, um, in order to, to magnify the colour, is I slightly defocus the star in the telescope normally you want it absolutely focused but if you if you defocus it very very slightly it makes the disc of the star bigger and it, i think it enables you to to see the color of the star even better now here's another double star it's called almec and it's in the 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 the, the, the um constellation of andromeda and it's got an arabic name and it means the desert lynx. And here you can see, uh, if you looked at it with the naked eye, it would just appear as one star. But in the telescope, you can see that it actually appears as two, two stars. And again, they're different colours. And that, that star, it is visible in the, in the southern hemisphere, and you will see it in your northern sky, uh, quite prominent in the month of October. But that's another example, and you can see, look, that they're, they're very obvious different colours. They're differing in glory. And you can see also that they're different magnitudes uh, from the, the different brightnesses. Mag magnitude is really a, a term um, describing the, bright, the, the, the apparent brightness of a star. Now, this graphic is another star trail uh, picture where the astronomers just um, captured the night sky for a long period of time, probably for about four hours, I, I would imagine, looking at the length. And you can see the trails of the stars. There's a particularly bright one. But what he's done is he's put a filter on to enhance the colours. And you, you can see, um, because instead of a point of light, it's a line of light, you can actually see that each star has a different colour. There's a red there's a red one there. The, these are, are yellow stars, and you can see white ones and, and so on. There's a blue star up there. I think he's put a filter on, or, or he, he's manipulated the image to actually enhance the colours. You, you won't see that with your naked eye to that extent. But it just shows you how the, the, the stars really do differ in glory one from another. Um, now... The observation of double stars, um, it, it raises the question, are these stars actually related to each other? Are, in other words, are, are they line of sight coincidences? And in actual fact, one star is quite close and the other star is quite distant. Or are the stars actually close to each other? And that's an interesting question because... The apparent magnitude of, of, of a star, that is the brightness that you can see with your eye, does differ. But the question I'm trying to put into your heads is, does the absolute magnitude of a star differ? In other words, if you put the star at the stars, at two stars at the same distance from the Earth, would they differ as well? Well, certain um, uh, double stars are actually known as binary stars. And they're called binary stars because they're actually related to each other. They're more or less the same distance um, from the Earth. And a good example of this is Sirius or the dog star. 
It's, it shines really bright in the UK skies. It has a magnitude of minus 1.44. It's a, but it, in actual fact, it's a double star. It's two stars when you put it under a microscope, the Sirius A and the Sirius B. And scientists have been able to show that in actual fact, Sirius B is orbiting Sirius A. So it's, they're actually in an orbit. Um, um, and so they're, relatively speaking, they're similar distances from the Earth. But, but Sirius B is very, very faint. In fact, you really do have struggle seeing it. So um, it, I've got a graphic there of um, Sirius that's taken through the Mount, uh, a telescope at the Mount Wilson Observatory in, in Pasadena. And you can see, if you can see my laser pointer, there's Sirius there, Sirius A. And then that little speck of light there, look, that's what astronomers call the PUP. And that is Sirius B. And it's orbiting. It appears over an extended period of time at a different angle around the star. So we know that it's, it's actually in, in a uh, physical relationship, if you like a gravitational relationship with the main star. And that shows to you that the absolute magnitude of stars is different because they are a similar distance from the Earth, and yet, yet they've got profoundly different brightnesses. Um, it, it is extremely difficult to see that uh, pup star there from the UK. I've never actually seen it because Sirius in the UK uh, skims the southern horizon. It's quite low down, and that doesn't make for good viewing through a telescope. You, you'd need a much more powerful telescope than I have uh, in, in, in order to see that pup star. But in, I, I suspect in Brisbane, because it will appear high in the northern sky, you, uh, and you've got very clear skies uh, in, in Australia, you would be able to see it with a fairly modest telescope. Now, another way in which stars differ in glory is that um, you, you might have noticed when, when you um, uh, look at a star, if they're very close to the horizon especially, they twinkle. They appear to twinkle in, in the sky. And um, Sirius does that in the UK because it's low in, on the horizon. I don't know whether it does it down in the southern hemisphere in Brisbane because it's higher up and it's less susceptible, but I suspect there is some scintillation. And when it scintillates, um, uh, it, it actually appears different colours. And you can see this in a telescope. When you look at Sirius in the UK through a modest telescope, it will actually, you look at it one minute, one second or split second, and it's red, and then it's blue, and then it's green. And that's the effect of, of, of refraction and, and the distortion of light through the Earth's atmosphere. And to illustrate that, what I've, what, what I've done here is reproduced a graphic where the, 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 the photographer superimposed about 30 photographs, 30 or 40 photographs taken in very quick su succession. And it's tracking Sirius in a very quick moment of time, a fast shutter speed, um, and he's taking a photograph every two minutes, something like that. And every time he's taken a photograph and imposed it, he superimposed them all on each other, you can see he's, he's captured a different point of refraction. I mean, there it looks red. Then you get a green light, and then, and then there's blue. And that illustrates in... In a graphic representation, what you actually see through a telescope, you actually see it changing colour. And so it really is true what um, the Apostle Paul wrote through the Spirit in, in, in Corinthians, that one star does differ from another star in glory. And that's actually an atmospheric effect. The, the star itself isn't doing that, but it, it is uh, true of how it appears from the earth. And, and, and really, you need to bear in mind that the scriptures record the heavens uh, from the point of view of an observer from the earth. That's the, the secret to always interpreting what the scripture says about the sun, moon, and stars. The sun doesn't literally stop in the days of, of, of Joshua. 
it, it appears from the eyes of an observer on Earth to stop. And that's the caveat that you always, I think, need to, to, to read into the, to the scriptures. Now, another way in which stars differ in glory is that they actually differ in brightness. And what I've got here is a picture of the constellation of Orion. And that's it. I picked that because it's a famous constellation. Um, and it appears in the southern skies of the UK in, in uh, the, 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 the winter. Um, and you also see it in, in Brisbane. But when you see it in Brisbane, it will be inverted. That star there called... Uh, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, this orange star. Notice the colour, the colour difference between these stars. That will appear where Regal does. It's actually inverted because you've got an inverted viewing position in the southern hemisphere. Now, if you look, look, look at this photograph, this stock photograph of the constellation of Orion, you've got the belt of Orion here, which is quite noticeable in the night sky and you've got this orange star uh, uh beetlejuice and it's bright you know we, when you compare it with this star regal here it's a very bright star but this this photograph here um was taken in the winter of 2019 2020 and look at uh, beetlejuice there it's not as bright Regal is much, much brighter than, than Betelgeuse. And what happened during the winter of 2019, 2020, is, is Betelgeuse started to fade. Its luminosity went down really remarkably. And you can see it's approximately the same, the same magni apparent magnitude as Bellatrix. They're about the same. Whereas here, on this stock photograph, normally it's a much, much brighter star. So stars differ in glory intrinsically in that they dim and they brighten. And in actual fact, uh, uh, Betelgeuse has now brightened and it's back to, to, the, to the full illumination that it, uh, it, it, it normally is. And it seems, um, from my observations of it, and this hasn't been substantiated by anything I've read, but it seems to, to change colour and go a darker colour as well. But what scientists are saying that is there a cloud of dust uh, is around in the location of the star and it was partially obscuring it. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, because I'm into observational astronomy, what I can see. Now, one of the few, very few star formations named in the Bible that we can actually really be certain of identifying is a star formation or asterism uh, called Pleiades. Its name's taken from Greek mythology, and the, the individual stars are actually named after the Greek gods. Well, that's no concern of ours. I'm just pointing it out because um, it's uh, uh, of, of interest. But it, it actually um, has a Hebrew name. The Hebrew name is Kimar, and it means a cluster or a heap. Now, the Bible's got no positional data on stars. You can know, Normally, when you want to identify a star, you need to know its magnitude and what position it's going to be on a certain day in the night sky. There's nothing of that in the Bible. So it's very, very difficult to, to know what star is meant by a biblical name because we don't know the position. But when you go to Job chapter 38, you can see there that... Um, the translators of the authorised version thought that uh, this Hebrew word kima uh, was um, a description of Pleiades. Verse 31 of Job chapter 38, canst thou bind the sweet influences of the cluster or the heap? And I think that's a fairly um, reliable identification of, of um Kemar as Pleiades um, in the authorised version because it is a cluster of stars and it's the most visible cluster of stars that you will see uh, in the northern hemisphere. It's also, of course, uh, visible in the, in, in the night sky in Brisbane. And I think you'll be seeing it set it, uh, if you go out after this address. 
in the night sky in the northwest, you'll be, be able to just see Pleiades setting in the in, in the night sky. Um, so if we look at it through a telescope, um, that's that's there is this cluster of sky, and you can actually see with the naked eye that it is a cluster of stars and. Um, you can see six or possibly seven, and sometimes it's translated in the Bible as the seven stars. And it actually appears as a, as a, a reference in the book of the Apocalypse, the seven stars in chapter one. But that's a, an illustration of where we can be fairly definite about the identification of a star uh, by its name uh, in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, in this same verse, um, in Job chapter 38 uh, and verse 31, um, you find mention of Orion. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Now, the Hebrew word translated Orion there means it is is Kezil, it's actually in the in your margin there of the Oxford Bible, and it means a fool. Um, and there is a, a constellation extant today that is called Orion. And we, in actual fact, we, we looked at it a few moments ago. It's the one with Betelgeuse in it and Regal in it. But that can't be <coughs> what the Bible is referring to. So what I'm saying is what the Bible calls Orion in, 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 in Job chapter 38 and verse 31 isn't exactly the Orion that we know. They've guessed. They don't know because there's no positional data, so they've taken a guess. And the reason I'm quite confident in saying that it's not Orion is because when you go to Isaiah chapter 30, 13, and perhaps you might want to, to look this up, Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10, you see the same Hebrew word, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof. And that Hebrew word constellations is the word Orion uh, that, you found, that we saw in Job chapter 38. Um, it's the same word, but here it's plural. And that's why they've translated it the constellations. I mean, you, you couldn't translate it the Orions. That wouldn't make sense. There's only one constellation of Orion. But there's more than one of these. Um, and so it must be something different to what we know as the constellation of Orion. And our, my understanding, my take on this, is that it actually refers to what astronomers call nebula, that are, and they're gassy clouds, not points of light that appear in the night sky. And by coincidence, the most famous of these is actually in the constellation of Orion. And I'm going to show it to you. Uh, no, no, that's the constellation of Orion, um, as 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 it's as it's uh, visible in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, you'll see it inverted, and there you, you've got uh, Betelgeuse, and you've got Bellatrix, you've got Regal, and then you've got the the, the three stars of the band of uh, Orion: Mintaka, Alninum, and uh, Alnitak. And here you've got a, a star called, uh, I think that's safe, safe, I think. And that, if you look at these, these are round points of light. Um, better tricks, it's a round, but if you look at this one here, look, it's a, it looks a little bit smudged. So we're going to take a close-up view of that. And when you, you come... To, to see it close up. There you've got your, your band of Orion, Alnitak, Mintaka, uh, there, and you can see it's not a star. It's, it's actually a smudge in the sky. And it, what it is is a huge gas of luminous cloud. And that is what I think it is, is referring to when the Bible talks about Orion uh, in, 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 in the scriptures. Well, we're going to go a little bit further in now, and that's what you'd see at around 50 times magnification through a telescope, except you'd see it in black and white. You would not, you would definitely not see any colour here, but you can see, you can see from this, 
photograph that's been taken over a long period of time, se several uh, uh, minutes or half an hour, whatever, in order to capture the, the more light and to expose the colour. Uh, you can see actually it is coloured, but through a telescope it would just look to be grey. But you can see, look, it's it's not a star. It's actually a, a massive uh, cloud in the sky. And it's actually been illuminated by some stars in the centre. And when we click onto the next, uh, um, you can see that there are four stars right in the centre of this dust cloud, and that's a, a, a magnification of them. And that is what astronomers call the trapezium. Um, in actual fact, there's six stars that are visible in a reasonable telescope. And if you look very, very closely between A and B, there's another point of light there. And that is star E. And then by C, there's actually another star, star F. And you can see those in a, in a, a, a four-inch refractor telescope fairly easy easily on a good night and so you can see there's a knot of stars and it, it it's surrounded by a huge cloud of dust and i think if just going back to uh, job chapter 38 i think that is what it means when it says canst thou loose the bands of orion can you separate that dust cloud i think that's the the challenge which god is placing before job um, and i think that's what um, Orion refers to in the scripture. It's on about these nebula and and, and 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 really these dust clouds or nebula, the one actually in Orion is is the one that is really is prominent to the uh, naked eye. Now I want to conclude, I think this is we're getting near the end, by going to the Epistle of Jude, the Epistle of Jude, and we're going to have a look at a phrase that Jude uses in the 13th verse. He's talking about the wicked, um, and he refers to the wicked as wandering stars. In Jude 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, if you took a, the, went back to the Greek, you would see the Greek there is the word planetes, and it's the Greek word from which we get a planet, the word planet from. And that is actually what it refers to. A wandering star is a planet. And that's because when you look at planets, they're different to stars. They're different in many ways. But when you look at a planet, they tend you can distinguish it from a star normally uh, because it doesn't twinkle, because it's much closer. It's in our solar system, and it's not a, uh, really a point of light. But they move in relation to the stars. They move across the sky. You can also see colours. If you look at it near the, um, the Pleiades, um, you will see Mars uh, at the moment in, in the night sky in Brisbane. And you can see it's red. When, when Saturn is in the night sky, and you'll see it in the night sky in Brisbane very early in the morning, just before sunrise, it looks yellow. And Venus looks white. So they're different colours. But the point I'm trying to make, apart from their different magnitudes and their different colours, is that they wander across the sky. They're, they're moving across a different path to the, the, um, to, 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 to the stars. Now, I've inserted here a picture of Saturn and Jupiter in the winter of 2020, this last winter. And this is called the Great Conjunction. And you can see here that there are two points of light there. And that is Jupiter and Saturn. Now, all winter through uh, last winter, I've been tracking Jupiter and Saturn across the southern sky. They've been wandering across the sky. Um, in this sort of direction, and they've been getting closer and closer and closer, and they actually virtually joined <laughs> together as a line of sight coincidence on the 21st of December. So they're wandering stars that wander across the sky. Um, th there's another one that's just happened in, in the last week. This is a, a graphic uh, of uh, the early morning sky um, in, in, in the UK. And you can see here that Saturn and Jupiter are very close together. And just before dawn, you might also glimpse 
Mercury as as well. And certainly in Brisbane, you'd see those two star two, two planets together now widely separated, um, Jupiter and Saturn. Whereas on the twenty first of December, they were very very close together. And of course, they're appearing in the morning now. Um, the photograph in December was in the evening, so they're wandering across the sky, not not uh, in any structured way. Apparently, um, of course, there is a structure to the way they they move. They do have orbits, but in relation to the stars, they're just wandering freely, and that is what uh, it, it, it's talking about in Jude. Now, I think that the most famous of, of the wandering planets is is, is actually uh, Mars because. Um, it actually really does appear to to wander in that it doesn't go in the same direction across the sky. Sometimes it has what is called a retrograde motion. It's orbiting the sun just like the Earth is orbiting the sun, but it's orbiting at a different speed. And sometimes the two planets overtake each other. And that appears, if you're an observer on the Earth, to cause it to wander across the sky. Now, I'm going to show you a photograph of Mars, and you can see Mars in the night sky in Brisbane at the moment. Um, it's near the Pleiades, and you'll see it setting uh, in a couple of hours' time, I would imagine, in Brisbane in the northwest. Um, if, you, if, if, if you superimpose uh, a, a series of photographs of Mars, these were, this is 35 photographs a week apart, and it's showing you the movement of Mars across the sky um, uh, over a 35-week period. And you can see there, look, it's, it's going in one direction, and then it appears to go another. And that's because it's an apparent effect, because we're viewing it from a moving platform that, that's um, orbiting the sun uh, at a different speed. And there you can see the Pleiades there. Uh, just just as a point of interest in this in this uh, uh, photograph, and that's really in my mind a fantastic illustration of what a wandering star is all about. Now, in Psalm 147, um, God informs us that He's given names of stars. So let's just look at this Psalm 147 and verse four. Um, he telleth the number of stars. That's an old English word to mean he, he counts the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Now, the stars are extremely multitudinous. There are many, many, many of them. And you, 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 I've got a couple of references on the screen to Genesis chapter 22 and Genesis 15, where uh, Abram was told that his seed would be as the stars of heaven for multitude. But of the billions of stars, in actual fact, approximately... <laughs> Only about 6,000 are visible to the naked eye. That's a very, very small fraction. That's if you take uh, the magnitude or brightness of plus, of plus six as, as, as a limit. Now, of those 6,000, only about 20 are first magnitude or really bright stars. Then you get about 48 second magnitude, 171 third magnitude, um, and, and, and so there are actually very, very few really bright stars down to the third magnitude that stand out in the night sky. Now, in modern times, only a few hundred are named. Are named. Uh, only a few of those really bright stars actually bear names. And you can see, if you go on Wikipedia, you can see a list of, of names. And you'll see that the names differ between cultures and languages. Uh, some of them have Chinese names. They're mostly Arabic. Some are Greek and Roman. Very few have Hebrew names. And of those, the ones that do have Hebrew names, only one or two actually appear in the Bible. And the point I'm making uh, really is you can't really speculate upon the names that God has given to the stars because very few of them are named in the Bible. And the Bible is really the limit to our knowledge. And who's to say, uh, really, that the, the names that appear in Arabic are actually the names that God gave the stars? You know, it, it may be right, it may not be right, but you can really, what I'm saying is you can only really place reliance on the Bible 
uh, and the few stars that are named there um, for, for serious scripture study. Everything else really is, is nothing more than, 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 than tradition. I couldn't resist doing this, uh, just to conclude this, this talk. That's a picture of me with a, a telescope I owned up to a couple of months ago. Um, it's a 120 millimeter uh, refractor. It's set up in my garden there. I've sold that telescope now because big isn't always better. Um, sometimes it's more useful to have a smaller telescope, uh, which you use more often, and that's the one that's replaced it. It's a smaller, uh, um, hundred and, it's a hundred millimeter telescope, Takahashi, um, which I use for my observations. And then for deep sky work, um, I use a, a Dow Kirkham design eight inch telescope. Um, that's it set up in my garden a couple of years ago. Well, thank you for listening, and I hope you found that uh, address to be informative and interesting. I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you.